from Che Guevara being a ruthless murderer and homophobic racist, he, he's not, he's just not, to 100 million people dying under communism, nope, that's not true either. There are so many myths, misconceptions, and outright lies about socialist countries that it's incredibly difficult to debunk all of them. Now, I have to preface this by saying that I don't think any of these states haven't made serious and numerous mistakes. However, there is also plenty that is incredibly dishonest. Criticism is always well warranted and helpful, so long that it is based in fact. Of course, the problem with the criticisms of these states is that so many of these criticisms are not based in fact. So, without further ado, let's get into examining a by no means exhaustive list of some of the more common myths and misconceptions about current and former socialist states. I detect a little communism I can see it in the things you do Just before we get into it, I'm doing basically a full 40 hours of work per week on these videos for not a single cent, and YouTube is not exactly going to promote videos like this one either, so please subscribe if you want me to keep making content in the future, and thanks a lot for your support. So it's true that the USSR did sign the molotov ribbentrop Pact with Nazi Germany, that divided up Eastern Europe between the two states. But it's not even close to the whole story. In fact, throughout the 1930s, the USSR tried repeatedly to ally with the UK and France, but their overtures were denied every time. The Franco-Soviet Treaty of Mutual Assistance in 1935 was the closest anyone ever got. But it wasn't really a treaty in any binding way, given French Prime Minister Pierre Laval's hostility towards the USSR with the French government refusing to accept a military convention stipulating how both armies would coordinate their actions in the event of a war against Germany. Joseph Stalin and Foreign Minister Maxim Litvinov tried even as late as 1939 to again form an alliance to stop Germany, and even Winston Churchill agreed with the USSR's proposal. But the UK and France stalled and stalled and stalled in the hope that Nazi Germany would stop its expansion rather than simply ally with the USSR. As the USSR tried and failed to form an alliance, the UK and France continually appeased Germany's aggression for years, letting Germany annex, among other things, the Sudetenland, Bohemia, and Moravia. Only when it became clear that time was running out for the USSR to find a way to prepare for war against the Nazis did it finally sign the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. After all, the USSR was fully aware of the Nazi policy of Lebensraum and knew the pact would never last forever. The reason they were trying to ally with the UK and France in the first place was because they knew they would eventually be invaded by the Nazis. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, then, was the USSR's way of buying as much time as possible to prepare for this war, since UK and France wouldn't help them. The most remarkable part is that 11 other countries signed non-aggression pacts with Nazi Germany before the USSR finally did so themselves. Yes, much of the land in Eastern Europe was divided up between the USSR and the Nazis in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. But it was either use the land as much as possible in order to industrialize in preparation for war with Nazi Germany, or give the territory to an enemy that you know will eventually invade you. From a diplomatic standpoint, the decision was common sense, and there's not a single leader of a single country that wouldn't have done the same if they were put in the USSR's position. The refusal of the UK and France to ally with the Soviets is one of the most incredible what-ifs of history that is never talked about. If the UK and France had formed a fully collaborative, strong military alliance with the USSR before Germany got too strong, this would have heavily discouraged Germany from invading Poland as regardless of Poland's understandable hostility towards Russia, they still would have had little choice but to accept the USSR's help to avoid being completely overrun. A two-front war instead of just one could have prevented World War II from being a fraction as destructive as it was, or, very conceivably, have even prevented World War II from ever happening at all. While the USSR has since been endlessly demonized for collaborating with the Nazis when, when you look at the facts, they had little choice otherwise, the inaction of the Prime Ministers of France and UK, as well as their foreign ministers, have gone almost completely unrecognized. Even though that same inaction is, I would argue, one of the single greatest crimes in human history that has gone almost completely unpunished and unrecognized. I detect a little communism I can see it in the things you do 
The gulags. One of the most common symbols of socialist brutality. Horrific hellholes where you would be lucky just to make it out alive. At least by Alexander Solzhenitsyn's account in his Gulag Archipelago anyway, which is by far the most popular account of the Gulag to this day. And is pretty much the original source of all the jokes about Gulags being unsurvivable hellholes. Even though the author himself not only survived the Gulag for eight years, and had cancerous tumors in his testicles removed while in one, but went on to live for almost another 60. Solzhenitsyn's book also throws around numbers that are completely incongruous with the facts. He argues that around 55 million in total pass through the gulags, mostly through talking to other prisoners. As if other prisoners would have had any remote clue as to exactly how many people could have passed through the 150 gulags spread around the USSR over the 20 plus years of their existence. All in all, he predicts without any real evidence that a minimum of 15 million people were in the gulags at any one time throughout their existence. Many historians relied heavily on the Gulag Archipelago, even though it's not an actual research document, but instead a literary investigation as is written literally on the cover of the book, until official records and documents were actually released, which showed a much different story from the narrative that had been pushed for so long. In actuality, of the USSR's population of roughly 150 million, 14 to 18 million spent, not at any one time, but at some point, time in the gulags from 1930 to 1953. Of this, studies of the actual evidence have showed that around 1.5 million, if not more than 2.5 million, died in the gulags or not long after the release from complications related to their stay. Taking into account roughly average estimates, 16 million divided by 2 million dead means that 8% of people who spent time in the gulag died there soon after. Not a small number, sure, but nowhere remotely near how the gulags are portrayed as these unsurvivable hellholes. And when we see that the USSR's population was 178 million by 1950, only several years before the gulags were closed down, the evidence shows that less than 1% of the USSR's population died in the gulags, and only as much as 11% spent any actual time in the gulags. That means that around 90% of the population never went into a gulag at all. Given that Russia experienced a revolution, a massive civil war in which they are invaded by numerous countries including the US, France, and the UK, and a world war in which they lost 20 million soldiers after that, that's pretty impressive. And unlike Solzhenitsyn's accusation that the gulags existed because of the USSR's supposed moral decay, the gulags, which existed under the Tsar Nicholas II when they were called Katorgas instead, actually existed just as any country's work prisons which existed at the time. To A, build up the country's economy, and B, to punish and repress political enemies, usually people accused of plotting against the country. You can of course argue how many of these people deserve to be imprisoned in the first place, but what isn't really arguable is the fact that the gulags are simply not nearly as brutal as they are commonly portrayed. In actuality, the gulags varied significantly in terms of the quality of their conditions based on the time and place they were located, as well as whether the camp was for more minor criminals or for people accused of being traitors to the state. Some gulags offered livestock raising courses, movies, newspapers, and plays. Others gave prisoners small pensions. Some prisoners were released early on good behavior, just like in modern prison systems. When the Nazis invaded the USSR, conditions naturally deteriorated significantly, the supplies became much harder to come by as the country was trying to survive a genocidal invasion from a foreign enemy. And this is the time where most prisoners that actually died did so. Ultimately, while the gulags were in no way an all-expenses-paid resort, they were in many ways dwarfed by the brutality of conditions in most capitalist colonies around the world at the time and still today under neocolonialism. Not to mention the conditions in factories in places like the UK when it first underwent its own industrialization. I detect a little communism. I can see it in the things you do. I'm not going to argue here that the DPRK is a great place to live. Not because it necessarily is or isn't, but because actually finding out any real information that isn't just propaganda one way or another is very difficult. 
And yet the world seems to sure know a lot about the DPRK, in spite of this fact. Viral stories in the Huffington Post, The Guardian, Time, The Telegraph, Gizmodo, NPR, and so on, about Kim Jong-un making every North Korean have his haircut, or claiming to get five holes in one in a single game of golf, or the entire North Korean football team being tortured for losing a game, or Kim Jong-un claiming to have found a unicorn layer, or that people are being executed for not sobbing enough, a throwback to the old lie that nobody would stop clapping for Stalin for fear of being executed, are, among numerous other outlandish claims, completely made up. The clapping myth, coincidentally, also comes from Zolzitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. Exacerbating the issue of misinformation, defectors from North Korea are often paid significant amounts of money to talk about their experience in North Korea, with significant pressure on them to exaggerate their stories so as to ensure they get as much media coverage and therefore as much compensation as possible. North Korea's two most notable defectors, Shin dong Kyuk and hyun -mi Park, who both have released highly successful books describing their experiences, have both admitted or been caught fabricating large parts of their stories or having serious contradictions in the stories they've told. Again, these aren't just two random North Korean defectors that happen to fabricate these stories. These are the two most well-known defectors there are. A member of the UN called Shin dong Kyuk the world's strongest voice against North Korea. And Yanmi Park was on Joe Rogan and has TED Talks with millions of views. She's also coincidentally basically a far-right, insane ethno-nationalist, but that's another story. Anyways, much like Alexander Solzhenitsyn and his Gulag Archipelago, the people that go the most viral and popular are always the people who make the most outlandish and dishonest claims, because those are the stories that always stick out far more compared to the usually much more mundane reality. I detect a little communism I can see it in the things you do The narrative around the Cuban Missile Crisis usually starts somewhere around the USSR placing nuclear warheads in Cuba seemingly out of nowhere as an act of aggression. But you, what you less often hear is that this was actually in response to the US having 15 missiles in Turkey on the US's border and Castro's very credible fears of a U.S. invasion of Cuba given the earlier Bay of Pigs and continuing aggressive actions from the U.S. We see a similar phenomenon today with America having over 700 military bases around the world, many very near the borders of their enemies, yet always claiming that these other countries are threats to world peace and stability when none of these countries have anywhere near the same amounts of military bases anywhere near the United States. Yeah, not much more to say about this one, really. Just another classic example of the dishonest Western framing of the issue. Well, that's about it for this video. I hope it was educational to you. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe, or comment, and I will see you next time.